take myself off mute. There we go. All right, so we're going to continue looking at the letters, the messages to the seven churches. Um, and we're not looking at the one to the church in Ephesus. Tonight, we're looking at uh, Jesus' message to the church in Smyrna. And so we think, and I've mentioned this before, that the letters are put in order in which um, the book may have been carried to these different churches along this sort of route right here. It's logical, makes sense to Ephesus as a very large port, and it's the largest of all these cities. So it makes sense to start there and just to move north before you come back around um, down towards the south. So Ephesus, the first letter, and now we're looking at the letter to Smyrna. Before we dive into this letter, though, I think since we've had a little time off, maybe it would be helpful to just kind of open the floor for questions about things we've covered, things you're unsure of in terms of chapters 1 and 2, anything that we've covered so far dealing with Revelation, or even maybe more generally some of the things that some statements that I may have made about end times, or we spent a couple of weeks talking about um, Israel and the Jewish people, questions about that, so... Kevin, can you take me out of the main speakers? Okay. I'm on here for the live stream, but we don't really need the speakers probably. So any questions that you guys have about any of that stuff? It did it? No. Come on, TV. Oh, did you turn off the stage? That's all right. He came up with a speaker solution that killed the TV. So... It'll come back eventually. There it is. And so did my voice. All right. So questions. Floor is yours. Anything you've been thinking about, wanted to ask, didn't ask, need clarification on? Nothing. Okay. There we go. You got it all down. You know it all. You guys should all be teaching tonight. Okay, that's fine. All right, so we're going to pick up then with this letter to the church in Smyrna. Now, one of the things that we've talked about is that these seven messages, or some people call them letters, even though they never circulated as individual letters, um, these seven messages um, follow a sort of structured pattern for the most part. Uh, they, have, they have a lot of similarities. So every letter begins and ends in roughly the same way. Every letter begins with an address to the angel of the church in so-and-so, which is immediately followed by a description of Jesus as the one who is speaking. Now, the descriptions are not all the same. In fact, in most of these messages, the description of Jesus, the way that Jesus describes himself at the beginning, in some way relates to the things that he has to say to the church. And we're going to see that especially in the message that we're looking at tonight. And then they all end in the same way, with some sort of promise and encouragement for the one who, for the one who conquers or the one who overcomes. And then in the middle, for most of the letters, you also have similar elements. So in most of them, you will have a sort of commendation, like, good job, guys, you're doing this well, and then followed usually by, you know, a negative statement something that they are not doing quite right. And then a warning about what's going to happen if they continue. And then usually they're called to repent, turn away from that, and then you move into the promises of the end. That's the kind of general pattern. We saw with the letter, the first letter, the first message to the Ephesian church, that you, <clears throat> that you had some doubling in there. Uh, in fact, you had two negatives in there. Well, now we're looking at this letter to the church in Smyrna, and it's a little bit different. The beginning and the end are the same as the other letters, but in the middle you have nothing negative stated about the church in Smyrna. They're not called to repent of anything. Um, no sins of theirs are pointed out. They're simply encouraged. And so this is one of two letters, or two of these seven messages, that's entirely positive in terms of the way that Jesus addresses the church. It doesn't mean everything he says is positive because he talks a lot about persecution and the threat of death and all those sorts of things, but the church itself is never condemned in any sort of way, never called to repent of any particular sins. That only happens in two of these messages, and this is one of them. And so 
That means that as we're covering it tonight, you don't have to hear a lot of negative stuff. <laughs> when we cover the church in Ephesus, the message to them, as they're told to you know, return to their first love and all those sorts of things, uh, we, had to, we had to talk about some, some ways in which we might be tempted to drift from Christ as our first love. So, here we are, church in Smyrna. Let's take a look at these different, we'll just walk through. Um, I don't know why it keeps saying Ephesus. I just didn't change things. That should say Smyrna, all right? We'll walk through the different elements. Um, there's one difference between what I'm going to put on the screen and then what you have on your paper, and I'll, I'll mention it when we get there. Um, but first of all, let's talk about the address. Here it is. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write... The words of the first and last who died and came to life. Jesus identifies himself in two ways. The first and the last, and then is the one who died and came to life. Now, when he identifies himself as the first and the last, that's another way of saying the same thing that God the Father said in chapter 1 verse 8. God the Father there says, I am the Alpha and the Omega who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So Jesus aligns himself with the Father. He presents himself as possessing the same divine characteristics as the Lord God, the Almighty. So if you ever come across someone... In fact, I saw two different um, videos that, uh, this week where you had people saying, challenging Christianity and saying, Jesus himself never claims to be God. Well, he does right here. <laughs> there are other places where Jesus claims to be God. Um, John 8, where Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. So Jesus does, in fact, claim divinity for himself in the Gospel of John and then here in the book of Revelation. I am the first and the last. That's unmistakable. He's drawing that language from the Old Testament, from the book of Isaiah, and there it's Yahweh who identifies himself as the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So Jesus unmistakably identifies himself as God. That's also, though, helpful, and this is probably not something that many of you will experience, at least not on a regular basis, but if you are ever attempting to share the gospel with a Muslim, one of the things that may be helpful for you is to know that the Quran itself, again drawing on Isaiah, the Quran identifies Allah as the first and the last. And the Muslim faith, of course, teaches that Jesus is not God. They don't believe in the Trinity. And they teach that Jesus was simply a great prophet. But they do, in one way or another, hold to the authority and inspiration of the New Testament. They're interpreted in a lot of different ways, and there are certain parts of the New Testament that they may not accept. But if you can point them to a passage like this and remind them that just as their own scriptures identify God as the first and the last, well, Jesus himself says, I am the first and the last. It's really helpful. Um, so if you're dealing with just somebody in general who makes a statement like, oh, Jesus never says he's God, or if you may happen to be um, talking to someone of the Muslim faith, this is a great passage to go, th go to to just show and prove that it's not just other people later on claiming that Jesus was God. It's Jesus himself. He is the first and the last. And then, of course, he identifies himself as the one who died and came to life. That's significant because that's going to help the, the members of the church of Smyrna because they themselves will have to face death. I said a minute ago that in these opening addresses, the way that Jesus introduces himself to each church normally ties in to the things that are happening in the life of the church. Well, this is a church under intense persecution or that is soon going to face intense persecution. And this is a church where some of the people may indeed be killed for their faith. It's really important for them to understand as they face death, that Jesus is the one who died and came back to life. And I think that's important for us too. 
Because whether or not your life is ever threatened because you're a Christian, all of us are going to face death. All of us at some point in time. You know our prayer requests? We had a few people mention in prayer requests that are facing death. All of us are going to face death. You can't avoid it. And to know that you serve one who died and came to life and promised he'll bring you back to life one day, that helps you to face death with courage. Whether it's coming as a threat from people persecuting you or it's just coming as the natural outcome of a long life or a terrible illness. Either way, to know that Jesus is the one who died and came to life is encouraging for anybody that's facing death. So let's take a look. Let's see what it is that they are facing in this commendation. He says to them, I, I know your tribulation and your poverty. Now to the Ephesians, he said, I know your works because that's what they had done well. But here he goes immediately to the thing that's for, at the forefront of their minds of the, of the Smyrnians. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you're rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So you have three real issues going on here. Tribulation, which is a broad general term for suffering. It includes persecution, but it's not limited to persecution. So it's just suffering in general. And then, more specifically, the second thing is, they're facing poverty. Now, why are they facing poverty? The truth is we don't really know. But there are a lot of possibilities. It's possible that the believers in Smyrna, because they refuse to participate in idolatrous worship that some of them may have lost their ability to work. You know, well, how does that, what does that mean? Well, so just like today we have unions for a lot of professions, you have a union, right? Um, and if you're not a part of that union, you may not be able to get work in that field. You might, but you won't make as much money, and it is, it's, it's likely that you won't be able to get any work at all. Well, they had something similar to unions. They had guilds, trade guilds. So for instance, if you were a blacksmith, you would be a part of the blacksmith guild, and you would need to have their seal on your business. It would be a seal that they would literally put um, sometimes on the door ray or sometimes on some documents showing that you're legitimate, and people would want to see that as they kind of came to hire you to do some blacksmith work. But also as a part of that guild, you had to be willing to make sacrifices to whatever minor god was, be was believed to be the god that was over that particular profession. And that's true for all of the major trades, not just blacksmiths. It's true for all of them. So that if you refuse to participate in that worship, then you were oftentimes kicked out of and removed from that trade guild. Which means that some of these Gentile believers may be poor because of their faith. It's entirely possible. It's also possible, on the other hand, because the third thing that he lists is the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not. We talked about that phrase when we spent those, did those two weeks talking about Israel and the Jewish people and what we said is that John makes a distinction here, just like Paul does in Romans 2, between those who are merely ethnically Jewish and those who are spiritually Jewish, okay? That is, those who receive the promises made to Abraham, which would be believers in Jesus. So those who say they are Jews and are not would be ethnic Jews who are not Christians and who have rejected the gospel. And we know from reading the book of Acts and even reading some of Paul's letters that early Jewish Christians were normally kicked out of the synagogue and excluded from the life of the Jewish community. This happened routinely. Paul would go into a city. He would preach the gospel first in the synagogue, and there would be some Jewish converts. And then the leaders of the synagogue would run him and whoever had become followers of Christ along with him out of the synagogue and then Paul would go into the marketplace and preach the gospel to Gentiles people would be saved and those Jews and Gentiles would come together to form a church that's how it would work 
But that little stage where Paul was run out of the synagogue and Jews who had believed in Christ were run out of the synagogue as well, that little stage is really significant if you're a Jewish person. One of the reasons it's significant is just because you lose contact with your, your whole cultural heritage and your family. That's, that's significant. But it's also significant, and this ties us back into the poverty issue. It's also significant because in the Roman world, Jews had special exemptions from having to worship false gods. So in many cities, for instance, you had temples to the emperor and people were required to come and make offerings to, at that temple for the emperor and make offerings to various imperial gods. Jews were exempt from that. They didn't have to do it with that, and they weren't punished for it. But what happens if you're a Jewish person who is kicked out of the synagogue and excluded from your family? It's likely that those special privileges that were yours are no longer yours. So that perhaps you were able to participate in your blacksmith guild without having to worship these pagan gods because you had this exemption and it was understood you went to the synagogue and you were Jewish and, and that was all fine. But now, perhaps, you don't have that cover anymore. So these things may all be tied together. Whatever the reasons, they were suffering general tribulation but also suffering poverty. And then they have this additional or kind of tied in there, they have the slander of those of the Jewish people in their area. So they're being verbally slandered. Tribulation probably refers to some physical tribulation and then they're having problems in terms of their ability to provide food for their family. It's hard to think of very many more problems that you could have. Those are broad categories. So Jesus says initially to them, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you're rich, and I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not. Jesus knows and is aware of their suffering. I want you to think about how it might strike you if you were one of those in Smyrna, suffering under all of these things, and you receive a message through the hand of a known apostle. By the time this letter is written, John is probably the last living apostle. He's probably famous, particularly among Christians living in this area you receive a writing from his hand and he has a message for you directly from Jesus. And Jesus says, I know. I'm aware of everything that you're facing. That's significant. We get that. We get it secondhand because this is also true for us. That he knows and understands the things that we're going through whether they're family problems or money problems or we're actually being persecuted for our faith. He always knows. But we receive it kind of secondhand, don't we? Can you imagine being one of those in Smyrna to have Jesus say directly to you, I, I know, I understand. There's a lot of power behind that. So Jesus then moves on and he calls them. He says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. So they're suffering already. Tribulation, poverty, slander, right? But apparently what they are suffering doesn't compare to what they're about to suffer. <laughs> Something worse is coming. He says, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you may be tested. So this is really interesting. The devil's going to throw them in prison. Now, who's actually going to throw them in prison? You would think the Romans, right? The Romans, are they're the governors. They're the ones who have the power to put someone in prison. Okay. But the devil is at work in and through those human agents. And the devil's going to be at work in and through human agents in your own life. It's going to happen. He's going to work through people to get to you. That's exactly what he's going to do here. But even behind that, 
God has a purpose and a plan for it. It is so that you may be tested. Now, the devil is not interested in testing your faith. He's not interested in that. But God is. This word for tested doesn't just mean given the test, but it also means tested in such a way that you prove yourself to be true. It could easily easily be translated proven so that you may be proven. Proven what? Proven to be real, proven to be genuine. In other words, the purpose of the test is to show the authenticity of your faith. The devil's not interested in that. This is God's plan and God's purpose. And God knows whether or not your faith is real, but now you will know. And now everyone around you will know. So the devil at work in your life is not all bad news. (laughs) Because God is at work in and through the devil's work. Just like he is in the book of Job. Nothing happens to Job that God does not sanction and allow. And yet Satan's doing it all. Same thing here. Satan's at work through human agents. But God has a plan and a purpose so that they'll be tested. Now, what do you think this last phrase is? Means, and for 10 days, you will have tribulation. Based upon some of the things that we've said in this study about apocalyptic literature, the kind of writing this is, how would you understand that phrase, and for 10 days, you will have tribulation? For a short time. He's not giving them the exact duration of the time that they're going to be tested. Numbers in apocalyptic literature are symbolic. And you often get multiples of 10 to either indicate on the low range, low end of things, that it's a short period of time or a short number of things. And on the high end, numbers like 1,000 or 10,000, denoting either a long period of time or a lot of something not meant to be an exact number. And what he is telling them is that the tribulation that you're going to face is only going to last a little while. Now that should sound familiar to some of you because Peter, in 1 Peter, says that you will be tested for a little while. Right? But when Peter says that, Peter is referring to the, the suffering that the church is going to face throughout its existence. He's not thinking of some specific, local, short-term tribulation. And I don't think John is either. In other words, from, from John or from Jesus' perspective, the suffering that we face is just for a little short time, just a little 10-day duration even if for us it's a lifetime, or if for the church it's centuries. That's a very short time for Jesus, very short. So that all of, all of our suffering, no matter how long it lasts, is ultimately in the big scheme of things, it's, it's, things, it's for a short time. Because we're, we're going to spend eternity in the new heavens and new earth with Jesus, with no suffering, so even if you, if you live 90 years and 80 out of those 90 years are suffering, say from age 10 on, you suffer. And you have very little downtime from your suffering. It's just a little while. Compared to century after century after century after century of no suffering. So it means a little while but it's a little while from the perspective of Jesus. And we would do well to take his perspective on our suffering. So he's warning them, but he's also calling them, don't be afraid of these things. They're coming. Something is coming that's worse than what you're experiencing now, and I don't want you to be afraid. So this is where my outline on the screen differs a little bit with yours. I divided this into two promises because I think it is two closely related but separate promises, okay? Both of these promises are accompanied by a command. Do this and I will do that. 
do something in response, okay? So promise number one, or first promise, he says, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, when Jesus says this, we shouldn't think of a literal crown that we're going to receive in the future that's called the crown of life. That's not what he means. It's the crown that is life. In other words, the thing that we are crowned with is life. So think about that. Be faithful all the way through death because you're going to get the reward of life. Now you can see why it's really important at the beginning for Jesus to identify himself as the one who died and came back to life. Because that's what he's saying they're going to face. That's what they're going to experience. They're going to have to remain faithful, and some of them, all the way to death. Because some of them will be killed in this persecution that's coming. But those who remain faithful all the way to the end will be given life. That's the first promise. Now the second promise. And this is where we get back to sort of the standard form of the letter. All of them have this, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then this address to the one who conquers, okay? Here he says, the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Now to understand the second death, I'm sure, we, I mean, we all have kind of just an automatic idea of what we're talking about here. But to be sure of the second death, and what John means by it, you can turn to, toward the end of Revelation where he talks about the second death. Revelation chapter 20. Where you have this, the, Revelation chapter 20 is the passage about the thousand years, the millennium. Controversial passage. We'll deal with it when we, when we get to it. Um, but what I, what I want you to see here in this passage is I want you to see the promises that are made. So in verse 4 he says, I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to, judgment, to, to judge was committed. So we're looking at judgment here. And I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or on their hands. So, very similar to what we're reading in this letter to Smyrna. Right? Very similar. Um, they were beheaded, that is, they were killed because of their testimony, because they didn't waver in it, they didn't take it back. Well, he's saying to, to these guys, some of you are going to face death in the midst of this persecution that's coming. And he says that they didn't worship the beast or its image. So that's similar to their refusal to participate or in, in worship that would have probably alleviated their poverty. They didn't do any of those things. They hadn't received the mark of the beast on their foreheads or on their hands. He says they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed, is the, blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. There's the second death again. The second death has no power over them. And as you continue to move on, as you read through the passage, you begin to see what the second death really is. Verse 9 They marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and false prophet were, and there they will be tormented day and night forever. So this second death is tied to being thrown into the lake of fire. So if your instinct on second death is to think that's probably judgment, that's probably hell, you're not wrong. But it doesn't have to just be your instinct. It's right here in chapter 20. And those who endure, or those who conquer, according to our verse in chapter 2, they will not be hurt by the second death. They are protected from it, guarded. 
This is the second time, second letter, second time, that we've seen this language of conquering. What does it mean? What do you think that it means to conquer in the book of Revelation? What are they conquering and how are they doing it? They're conquering death. Okay, what else? Sin, okay. Nobody, I'm not, nobody's wrong. I'm just... Yeah, they are. They're conquering Satan, the beast, the false prophet. All of those are thrown into the mix at some point in Revelation as those who are conquered. Yeah. Perseverance in terms of their conquering um, all the things that would pull them away. Right? Cause them not to persevere. They're conquering all those things. They're staying faithful. Okay? So they're, they're conquering Satan, the beast, death itself, sin. They're, they're victors over all of these things. How? Now, part of the answer to that is they're remaining faithful. But beyond that, you can cheat if you want. Does anybody have the ability... Do any of you have a Bible app where you can do word searches? Why don't somebody look up conquer in the book of Revelation? It's going to be in there a lot, so try to find some passage where it tells you you're conquering by something. Let's see what we can come up with. The regular Bible app, I don't think, does that, does it? I think you have to have other apps, like Bible study apps. Oh, yeah. It'll work in just the regular Bible app. It'll work. You can do a word search. Hmm? Overcome, conquer. Yeah. The, the root, actually, interestingly enough, is um, Nikao, from which we get the word Nike. Nike. Right? Okay. Hmm? There's a bunch, right? This is a this is a huge theme. It's in all of the letters, so we get it at least seven times in chapters two and three. Sometimes Jesus is the one doing the conquering. Sometimes we're the ones doing the conquering. It is in relation to our union with Christ that we are one with Christ, which is tied to adoption. How? So we know what we're conquering. My second question is, how are we conquering? Faith, okay. By the blood of the Lamb. Yeah. We're conquering. In Revelation, Jesus conquers both in his death, resurrection, and in the final judgment. But we conquer, we participate in his conquering through his blood. That, that's how we actually conquer Satan, the beast, Satan's other allies, death itself, Sin, we conquer all of those things by or through, that may be it, maybe the ESV says through. The word can be translated either way. By or through the blood of the Lamb. And so even though over and over, it's, we see to the one who conquers, and we're the ones conquering, the reality is that in John's understanding of this, we only conquer through or by the blood of the Lamb. It's by participating in the victory that Jesus won on the cross that we become conquerors. And we participate by trusting in Him. So that what our suffering does, if we, if we go back up, our suffering tests us shows our faith to be authentic, genuine, real, proven, 
our faith in Christ, in his work on the cross. And so our suffering helps to show as we remain faithful and don't give up on following Jesus, it helps to show that we've really trusted in him and therefore that we are participants in his victory. And so the one who conquers is really the one who keeps believing. Come what may, even in the face of death or poverty or tribulation or slander, we keep trusting in Jesus. And by trusting in Jesus, we are those who conquer and we cannot be hurt by the second death. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That for, that for Christians, we're never promised that we won't suffer in this world. But what we are promised is victory over the second death, and that means that instead of an eternity of suffering, we're set free from suffering for eternity. So that whatever we face now, we should view it as a light and momentary affliction, whatever we face now. That doesn't mean that we should look at each other's suffering as light and momentary, right? We, we, look at, we think of each other's suffering in relation to you know, other suffering in the world so that we can appreciate and understand and sympathize what, what other people go through. We don't want to minimize anyone else's suffering in saying this. What we want to is ourselves look at our own suffering, no matter how deep, how long-lasting it may be, and remind ourselves it's small in comparison to what lies ahead. It's just a little while. It's 10 days, and I get 10 billion years plus infinity in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We won't be hurt by the second death because through our faith, we participate in the victory that Jesus won. That's the long way to say it. All right. We got five minutes, so questions and comments over any of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, right, that's it. Yeah. yeah, and one of the things that we're going to see, one of, the, one of the things that I'm going to argue later on when we get to chapter 12, I think chapter 12 is, I don't want to call it the high point of, Revel of the book of Revelation because that's, that's the end. It ends on a high point. But chapter 12 is sort of like the, the center or the, it's like a pivot point, and the rest of the book turns on it. All right? It's, it's central. It's significant for understanding John's whole message. And so it's not surprising that you would have that statement explaining our victory in what I think is probably the most crucial chapter in the whole book for understanding the whole book. That's not surprising at all, that it would be right there. So, we'll, But we'll get there. And I'll explain why I think it's so important, why it should get a lot of our attention. And what's funny is that oftentimes chapter 12 is one of those chapters that gets passed over very quickly because you don't see as much stuff that sounds very end times-ish in there. I mean, you do see a dragon and all that, but it doesn't sound like it, it's not future-oriented. It doesn't sound future-oriented. And so oftentimes people will breeze past chapter 12 really quickly when in fact chapter 12 is like sort of the foundation for everything. But we'll get there. Other observations or questions? All right. Then I'll close this in prayer. Father, we thank you that um, this little message to the church in Smyrna has been preserved for us for nearly 2,000 years. 
not only so that we can look back and appreciate what, what these early believers went through and what they endured, but so that we can be encouraged to know that we can experience the same kind of victory that they experienced. That no matter what trials and suffering may come upon us, we can conquer through the blood of Jesus. And so I pray that this, this message would be an encouragement to us to remain faithful to the end, even unto death. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.